Hey, 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 you're listening to KRSP going right through the night here on Religious Studies Radio. I'm David Robertson. And I'm Chris Carter. Are you sort of parodying Queens of the Stone Age there? I was kind of being like an American radio station because uh, tying into our theme of American popular culture, um, we are this week talking about America's dark theologian, Stephen King. Um, And this is an interview with Douglas Cowan, which was recorded by Carmen Celestini. So I'm going to pass right over now. Okay, today I'm speaking with Dr. Douglas Cowan about his recently published book, America's Dark Theologian, The Religious Imagination of Stephen King. Welcome to Religious Project. Um, What is the religious imagination to you? I think the religious imagination, especially as it relates to Stephen King, is the idea or the, the, the package of ideas of how we articulate our evolving understanding of what William James called the unseen order. William James takes a lot of flack, but his is the definition of religion that I kind of advert to. He called the life of religion the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme good, whatever that is and however we imagine it, is a function of our sort of negotiation with that unseen order. The thing that makes it a valuable definition, I think, is that it avoids the supreme being problem. You don't have to have a belief in a God. It avoids the true or real religion problem, which is endemic in pop culture criticism of science fiction and horror. Well, they go, well, that isn't real Christianity or that isn't. It avoids that. And most importantly, and this is what's really important for Stephen King, It avoids what I've taken to calling the good, moral, and decent fallacy, the belief that you can define religion according to goodness, morality, and decency, which is to say, if if something is good, moral, and decent, it is by definition religious. Mm -hmm. And if it is not good, not moral, not decent, uh, flying planes into buildings, human sacrifice, uh, demons, you know, know, that kind of thing, right? Um, it is by definition false religion or a cult. That is probably the single most endemic problem in religious studies, this belief that religion is by definition or should by definition be considered a, a good thing. And I think that is the one thing that Stephen King challenges in his writings from beginning to end. I would agree with that. Yeah. So, um, what are the criteria that you applied to this and how you applied it to the Stephen King work? Basically, all I did is I started reading his books in order. I mean, the only way to answer that question is, is yeah. methodologically. Um, basically, I just started with, with Carrie and read the books in the order that he wrote them. Not that that's the only way you have to do it, but I wanted to see if things change. I want to see if... Um, how he starts dealing with questions of the unseen order. What does the unseen order look like for Stephen King? And does it, when it interacts or intersects with, you know, sort of traditional understandings of religion, how does he basically say, because this is where the groundwork is for him, how does he basically say, you think you have it figured out? Check this shit out. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because that's what he does. Every time you think you have it figured out, he says, here's another option. And by the way, this is no more or less viable than your story, your fiction. Right? So when you saw that arc happening, like, what do you think was predominant? Just like the shock factor, the questioning factor, or do you think that it was a symbol of his evolution and his no, own it's question? the questions? It's absolutely the questions. He doesn't, his, his thinking about religion doesn't really evolve. And I think the reason is um, like, if you were going to look at HP Lovecraft, mm-hmm. HP Lovecraft was a thoroughgoing materialist who didn't believe in anything that he was writing about. Right. Despite what, you know, people say it's simply not true. Um, So, you know, when he writes his horror stories, and there's a resurgence of Lovecraft right now, when he writes his horror stories, he is writing about something that is purely of the imagination for him. Contrast that with Phil K. Dick, Mm -hmm. who had very profound religious experiences, and uh, in Naked Self-Interest, again, I'm working on a companion (laughs) book to ADT, which will be called America's Reluctant Prophet, which does exactly what I did with Stephen King, with Philip K. Dick. But Philip K. Dick, 
you have to be able to map his biography onto the fiction mm-hmm. because his biography and his fiction are so interrelated. He actually includes in one novel a character called Philip K. Dick <laughs> in Radio Free Albemuth. Um, Stephen King, you can't do that. There have been a couple of attempts to try and map his own religious thinking onto his fiction. I saw no evidence that you could actually do that. What he's really interested in his questions. In fact, he says as much. He says, answers change. I'm not interested in answers. I'm interested in questions. And this is where I came up with the idea of uh, properly human questions. I think that's yeah. in this book. Yeah. Um, the you know, we have what we traditionally call in RS classes, <laughs> religious questions. Where do we come from? Uh, where are we going? What happens when we die? You know, what about evil? All those sorts of things. Those are not religious questions. Religion has claimed ownership over them. Religion has claimed proprietary rights over them. Religion has claimed, obviously, to have answered them. But they are not religious questions per se. What they are are properly human questions. They are ours by right of our our humanity and our humanness, not our participation in one particular religious tradition or another. And I think this is what I got mostly from King, is that King is is saying the same thing. So every time you think you've got it figured out, I'm going to come at this from another angle and say, really? (laughs) Really? You think you have it figured out? I mean, people say that The Stand is still very common to write that The Stand is his most religious novel. I don't think it is. What do you think it is? Uh, His most religious novel? That's a really good question. I think it's the novel Desperation. Really? Why? Um, Desperation, if you know the novel The Stand, The Stand is this uh, massive sort of good versus evil war that takes place in the aftermath of a global pandemic called the Captain Trips virus. And there is a devil figure and there is a, the people say it's a God figure. It is, it isn't. It's actually more of a Moses figure. Um, but it's this big kind of clash of ideas and who's going to win in the end. Even you know who's going to win in the end because there's this rather clumsy deus ex machina at the end that ends the stand, right? When the, when the tramp comes in and like detonates the nuclear <laughs> yes. bomb. Um, desperation is very different. Desperation takes place at the level at which religion takes place for real people, which is to say individual relationships. And it is much more theologically sophisticated. In that, what it does is it questions the relationships that we have with the unseen order in a way that the stand never does. And it questions them through the eyes of the people who have a lot at stake, particularly a young boy named David and an old man who is trying to like recover lost glory. And they come at the same question of who is God and why is God so cruel? Desperation, I think, is is one of his best books because it's about theodicy. The entire book is about theodicy. And the other thing that's interesting about Desperation is it was also published at the same time with a book called The Regulators. The Regulators is um, the same story told from a slightly different perspective because he published The Red- the Regulators as Richard Bachman. Really? And whereas Desperation takes place in this abandoned mining town called Desperation, it's about a quadruple entendre, huh. the title. The Regulators takes place on one block in a street in Iowa. I think it's Iowa. And all the characters are there, but they have different um, aspects. David, in desperation, is not the 14, 13, 12, 13, 14-year-old boy who is the voice crying in the wilderness going, why are you so cruel, God? David is one of the guys who gets killed in the first chapter. Oh, my God. Right? So it's a very different way of looking at it. So even then, even offering us desperation, King says, you know what? Don't ever take this as the gospel. Mm. Here's another way of coming at exactly the same story. So when I think of books that are um, are most religious in the mm. traditional sense, I actually think of desperation. When we think of um, those properly human questions, I think of um of uh, books like Revival, which mm. is his nod to Frankenstein. If Salem's nod is nod is his is Salem's lot is his nod to Dracula, Revival is his nod to Frankenstein. Wow, such fascinating stuff! Um, now I'm going to have to read Desperation.
Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, the Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, uh, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash Project RS and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people in their learning. So if you can help um, either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now back to the episode. How did you do this research? Basically, um, what I was interested in And people ask me, you know, did you interview King? No, that's not useful. Did you interview, uh, did you audience reception? No, that's not useful. The reason is, uh, it's the same way I approach um, film and television, is I want to approach the pop culture product with the same valence or the same eyes that anybody else would approach it, which is to say, the vast majority of people who read a Stephen King novel are never going to watch an interview with Stephen King. They're certainly never going to meet him. They're certainly never going to have the chance to ask him, so what did you really mean on page 27? (laughs) Right? They're never going to have the chance to do that. So I'm interested in this kind of the the, the true popular nature, right? If I can put it that way, of, of his work. So basically what I did is I read it as a reader. And But I read it as a reader who has a certain critical eye as it relates to religious studies and sort of started asking questions of the text, which would be like, for example, in uh, Desperation. So I said, that book is all about theodicy. Why does, why do we suffer? Why does God make the small children die? Horribly, in fact. Why, uh, why was mom taken away? Why is God so cruel? Why is God so cruel? Is God, and if God is so cruel, is God the only God? Or is God in contention? This big G God in contention with other gods? And those are profound questions. Now, especially, I think, is one of the things that I wrote, I think it's at the end of Sacred Terror, is people have criticized horror incorrectly as this kind of stealth nod to secularization. I don't believe that's true at all. I believe that what horror films, uh, horror culture writ large, horror novels like this, what they speak to is this profound ambivalence that we have towards our religious beliefs, religious beliefs that we absolutely don't want to give up but we don't completely believe, but we're afraid to kind of abandon. So we're in this very strangely ambivalent place about uh, religion, and it all turns on these same questions. I mean, anybody with first-year knowledge of religious studies is going to go, oh, well, yeah, but that's just the Job story, (laughs) except... And this is the question that I consider in Magic Monsters and Make Believe Heroes. Why do we keep telling the same stories over and over? We keep telling the same stories over and over because our answers change, but the questions remain the same. You can be told, I don't know, maybe you grow up, you're told, um, you grow up Catholic. I don't know. Let's let's say. Let's say. Let's say. You grow up Catholic and and, and you're told that uh, God you know, things happen in this life because we're meant to endure them and we get our reward in heaven. It's, you know, 2,000 yeah. years people have been told that, right? Well, there's a time when that answer satisfies, or at least that there's a time when that answer shuts the questioner up, whether it satisfies <laughs> or not. But when people start asking the same question without being willing to accept traditional answers, Right. I mean, that's what moves religion along. I mean, that's 
that why the Reformation happened. That's why the the filioque split happened. That's why you know all of the different streams of Christianity in the first three centuries. And the other thing that is really really important about it this is they're all stories. Religion is about stories. It's not about fact. It's not about truth. It's about stories. Stories motivate us. That's the reason, or at least one of the reasons, the Gospel of Thomas doesn't make it in because it's a sayings gospel. Yeah. Right? Stories stick with us as, as, as homo narrans. Yeah. Right? As the ones who tell stories. We are addicted to narrative. Anything of value, we pass on through story. And I think that one of the things that is so interesting about Stephen King is he absolutely recognizes. I'll give you an example. Pet Cemetery, which I understand that they're remaking. Really? Next year. Uh, John Lithgow as the Judd as, really? as, as as the Judd character. Um, it is as though Stephen King had Turner's The Ritual Process open on the desk <laughs> beside him when he was writing the sequence in the novel. And I, and just to be clear, yeah. I don't deal with TV or film adaptations. Mm-hmm. I just deal with his novels and I don't deal with his fantasy novels. I don't deal with the dark tower and because yeah. he's clear that that's high fantasy. Um, there's a scene in, um, in Pet Cemetery, when uh, Judd and Lewis are taking uh, Church, the cat, and by the way, it's short for Winston Churchill, so nothing <laughs> should be read into that. Um, he, they're taking the, the cat who's been killed in the road. Yes. I mean, it's, a, it's a bog standard mm-hmm. sadness up to the Pet Cemetery. So they're going into the woods, they're going up to the Pet Cemetery, but Judd says they're going further because just on the other side of the Pet Cemetery is a deadfall. A bunch of trees that have come down, branches, very, very dangerous to cross. If you've ever been hiking where there are deadfalls, very dangerous to cross. That is the boundary between the real world and the liminal space on the way to the Micmac burying ground. And they go through a number of these. They, they, cro- they have to cross the, um, the, uh, the deadfall. Then they have to go through this swamp where the ground actually seems to drop away because of the ground fog. Then they have to climb up onto this, 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 this hilltop, right? To get to the Micmac burying ground. So it is absolutely the ritual process going back. And Judd is his initiator. Judd, there is a difference. I make this point in the book is there is a difference between uh, transgression or tra- there's a difference between transgression, transcendence, and trespass. Transcendence and transgression both involve, over to different degrees, the um, the idea of a guide, someone who has said, "You have permission, and I'm going to show you the way." Because Judd says this; he actually says it explicitly: "Put your feet where I put mine." And don't look down, which is to say you trust your guide in the ritual process. And then when you read that section, like I say, it's like he had Turner's The Ritual Process open on. Uh-huh. Or he was reading, you know, Vashon app. <laughs> yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Makes complete sense. Absolutely. And I remember that scene. I remember how scary Pet Cemetery was when I was reading it. It was yeah, it's, it is actually books. one of the it's actually one of the books that if people um if people say what's the scariest Stephen King book you read they 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 tend to think about it <laughs> and they tend to think about Pet Cemetery. What's interesting about Pet Cemetery is Stephen King himself didn't want to publish it. He had one more book left on a contract to a particular publisher. I think it was Viking, but I don't know. Um, and uh, he had one more book to fulfill the contract. And Tabitha, his wife, said, "Well, why don't you publish Pet Cemetery?" And he goes, "Nah, it, it goes too far." <laughs> Because it involves the death of a two-year-old yeah. boy. The whole thing is energized by the death of a two-year-old boy. Um, and even for Stephen King, that was even too far. Of course, he goes further than that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the novel I read at Hartsfield Jackson Airport was Dr. Sleep. Oh. Which I actually really like. I actually really like Dr. Sleep. It is the sequel to The Shining. I haven't read that one yet. 
but Pet Cemetery scared me. It didn't scare me because I don't think I'm afraid of clowns. I mean, you say that at the beginning of your book too. It's like not the thing that you're most you know terrified yeah, of. Yeah, spiders. Spiders. I'm my, with you on that one. Spiders <laughs> kick my fight or flight gear in. I actually, when I read that in the book, I kind of smiled because I was like, I'm terrified of spiders. I'll just point and be scared at them. And I was like, Doug's afraid of spiders, really? Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> Doug is. And horses because they're crafty at both ends and evil in the middle. That is true. All right. So, one final question. Sure. Why do you think that this research matters? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that if you do um, pop culture, you have to deal with in the academy is people not believing that it is it should be taken seriously as a barometer as an indicator as a way of understanding popular perception or perception of just about anything and i actually think that you could not be more wrong in that and here's why ask yourself how many conversations you've been in that began I mean, aside from graduate school, uh, that you've been in, that began, well, you know, yep. as they say in chapter three of the <laughs> ritual process, what do you think about Turner? And you just like your eyes glaze over. Or how many t- how many conversations have you been in where, um, well, you know, to, you know, French existentialism <laughs> believes that suicide is, is the option that everybody should, as opposed to. Every conversation you've ever been in that begins, hey, did you see the latest episode of Doctor Who last night? Yeah. Hey, have you read the latest Stephen King novel? Hey, have you seen the new version of it? Mm-hmm. Right? And you get drawn into those stories. I think people denigrate genre fiction because they believe that it is simply boarding lounge fare. It's simply what you read from Toronto to Vancouver when you're going to a, a conference. And um, my argument in all four pop culture books is, and in although Philip Kedek has taken much more seriously, but I argue that these are not a new mythology in the sense, you know, people have said, well, Star Wars is a new mythology. That's not true at all. Um, what it is, is these are one more way in which we approach those same properly human questions. At some point in the book, I think I write about how um, this is not religion. This is not horror as religion. It's not horror in place of religion, which is to say secularization. It's not even horror on top of religion, which is to say religion is somehow a substrate. Mm-hmm. What it is, is horror alongside religion, which is to say Stephen King and religious believers are asking the same questions. And because religion is based in story, religion is based in what are called unnatural narratives. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, um, the, the very unnatural nature of them is used to validate them. Who could possibly make up a story about a giant boat with all the animals in the world? Therefore, it must be true. Well, who would possibly make up a story about a flying horse taking the prophet from Mecca to Jerusalem in one night? That's absurd. Therefore, it must be true. It's like, you know, you know, um, what is it? Credo qui absurdum, I believe, because it is absurd. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're all stories. So what makes these stories that answer properly human questions that we have valorized as religion fundamentally better than these stories, which also purport to address, if not answer, because Stephen King is absolutely clear. He's not <laughs> answering questions. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to continue to kind of poke the bear. Right. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thanks so much for that interview, Carmen and Douglas. Um, I'm sure all of our listeners, uh, or at least the vast majority, sorry to make a sweeping generalization there, will have their own thoughts on Stephen King. Um, so you might want to, to add those to the comments on the website or on social media. Um, my favorite um, sort of Stephen King that I've been introduced to recently was that Netflix's um, Gerald's Game, mm. um, which which was 
absolutely fantastic. Just, uh, I love his style of horror. Uh, well, sometimes he goes in for the sort of big, scary, beastie, weird thing, but a lot of the time it's super psychological. So. Yeah, I, I, I could literally talk for hours about Stephen King. I've, I've gone through phases of absolute obsession with him uh, as a writer. Yeah, and you should check out um, David's uh, Stephen King anecdote at the end of the last podcast if Indeed. you missed that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, we're sticking with America uh, next week as well. We've got an interview... Um, Second interview by Ben Marcus, yeah. Indeed, uh, and this time he's speaking to Robert P. Jones on America's Changing Religious Landscape, um, which should be interesting. Uh, we've done a fair bit on kind of con contemporary American political scene, but this, is this I think we're talking about demographic changes and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and it'll tie in nicely with some podcasts that we recorded way back in the first year of the, the RSP and thinking... Um, my interview with Ariella Kesar on, I think that was called What Do Americans Believe? And that mm -hmm. was a demographer's mm -hmm. look. We had David Vos talking about um, quantitative methods. That's right, yeah. Um, we've had uh, Ryan Cragen speaking about um, the, the, the global demographics of Mormonism and things. So, you know, and it's good that. to turn our lens onto North America from time to time, and especially at the moment as we've just uh, announced that... Um, Nasser members now have access to our Patreon material as a, an added uh, bonus of their sponsorship of the RSP. A BASR members also already have access to all of that material. That means they get the classroom edits of the interviews, which is basically the interview for teaching. Uh, so you can give it to your students without them having to listen to our mindless prattle. Uh, as well as some bonus material, including uh, discourse episodes, which is our, our take on current affairs and news stories in which religion, in quote marks, plays a part. Exactly. And, um, actually, Benjamin Marcus is going to be recording one of those for us yeah. in the very near future. And, and I'm recording one this week um, in Helsinki, where I am right now. Uh, yes, that's confusing. Um but if you'd like to get involved in that, um, as, you know, coming on to, to take part in a discourse episode, um, we do them online. So, uh, or usually we do them online. So if you'd like to take part, just drop us a line at editors at religious studies project.com. Um, we'd be great to keep the pool of voices on that show really diverse. Yeah. But for now, um, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox, and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop, and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at Patreon.com slash Project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. <laughs>